All right, Gary, now that we've, we've kind of covered the other big essentials, um, the last piece might actually be some of the most important. Like, how do we get mm -hmm. more purposeful with our people? How do we handle what we call leverage in a shifted market? Yeah, well, the first, yeah, absolutely. It becomes the most important piece of all, right? The number one is you have to make sure you've got the right business model, right? You have to aim right at the market that you think you can win and the competitor you can beat. Right. And, and using that kind of as your mantra, get your get your model right make sure your business model is right build for where you want to be in three years to five years right and the math right we talk about your model and your math have probably changed sure get really clear about that because that impacts everything that comes after yeah and you yes all aspects of your model not just your lead gen model but all aspects of your model just Think it through and make sure that the model that you're currently operating under is the model that that will get you where you want to go in three to five years, Jay. You don't want to be just living in the present. You need to be operating a, a future tested or future vision model, if you will. Otherwise, you're, you're just going to accomplish today's goals, but you won't set yourself up for the future. Yeah, you're not building a foundation for anything big. A lot of people, though, will panic in a shift and they'll throw out the future. Mm -hmm. They're so um, heck bent, if you will, on surviving the present that they forget that if they survive, what will the what will their business look like? Oh, and, we've and they seen throw, examples and they throw it of out. that. We've seen examples of that already. We don't have to name names of so people who from the outside in it looks like they've basically thrown the baby out with the bathwater oh she cut cost and ballast you know we talked about it people cutting their coaches their lifelines oh, yeah. um making rash decisions for survival versus taking a beat and making great decisions yeah so you have to number one is you have to get your business model right all right number two once you've done that then you've got to get your business goals and your plan right as well so I've got my model, now I set my goals, right? So my goals and my model are in, are in sync. Then I have to have a plan to achieve it and a budget to support it. So I have to kind of go through this, this whole idea of my model, my goals for the model, the plan it's gonna execute and the budget, what's it gonna cost me to do that? And if you kind of have that sense of all of that, then you go right to your org chart and you ask the question, what will the army or team look like that I need the business needs in order to survive and thrive and set us up for the next three to five years. I'm not sure a lot of businesses go through all of those steps before they address the org chart. Sadly, when you look at a lot of industry, the first place people go, because we know we've done the studies, you space, technology, and people salaries tend to be like three of the highest cost in most business. Oh yeah, that's So right. they go, they take out, their acts and instead of cutting the fat, they, they might be getting some muscle and bone. Yeah, that's uh, But I love that as a setup. So now that you've got a clear idea of what your value proposition is gonna be going forward, you can ask now who are the people that need to support that and yeah. that budget. Yeah, what's the org chart, yeah. right? The, um, for a football uh, team, it's gonna be 11 players on the field. Right, <laughs> but some matter more than others. Well, okay, there you go. So let's kind of talk this through. So we have a word overwhelming. I want to go there. I know we've talked about the five in your box, but yeah, some matter more than others. Yeah, that's right. So we have so we have an org chart. So we now have a sense of the number of people uh, and what they would be doing in order for us to execute today for the present mm -hmm. to survive and also to be setting us up to thrive in the future. So first thing we ought to do is we have to focus in on the key positions, right? We have to look at those what you and i would call wealth determiners the individuals that are definitely at the in the leadership position that make all the difference and make sure that we have the right people in those positions and that's either letting someone go or promoting someone up uh, or recruiting someone from the outside but upgrade slash top grade those positions to make sure that you not only have the people to survive but you have the people that are motivated, uh, inspired, and willing to do the work today in order to not only win the day, but to also win the future. Those people show up pretty quickly in my experience. I've now gone through two of these with you, but you, well, I guess three, if you count 2001. Yeah. Um, but some people see the, the chaos that ensues with the market shift, right? The storm has arrived. Some people oh. see that inherently as an opportunity. 
And they know that in this time of change, they can accelerate their career. And so like, that's right. They got the new model. You've communicated it. Their job description has changed. Some people literally will check out. Yeah, that's right. They will basically try to turtle and hide <laughs> um, and they won't be making visible pro progress. Yeah. And other people will raise their hand and say, I took care of what you asked me for and I've got more bandwidth. And those are those people when you talk about promoting from within, um, those are the ones that I get excited about. Yeah. Well, there's you and I've talked about this, but there are um, companies that people flee from <laughs> and there's companies that people flee to. And you want to be that business. The ones that they flee to. That's right. Right. Because they look up and they're like, man, it's chaos here. There's layoffs happening, whatever's happening. And they're not hearing a vision, a clear vision for their new, their new model. That's right. And how they're going to navigate it from That's their right. leader. Right. That's right. That's right. And if you're doing that, word gets out. And that becomes an opportunity, right, to you may be acquiring new talent. Yeah, that's right. The, the, you, have a better, you have a better opportunity to attract great people in a recession. You can increase your talent share. Yeah. It's and, funny, right? It's like mind share or market share. There's a certain amount of talent in any given industry, and yes. you can increase your talent share in this yes. moment in truth. Yes, that's exactly right. So you're going you're gonna to focus in on your key positions. You're going to top grade. You're going to upgrade. You're going to promote. You're going to recruit. You're going to do what you need to do so that you, you know that, that going into this as fast as possible, you have a, a, a group of individuals that are beginning to work as a well-oiled team who are focused not only on surviving, but also thriving in the future. And they're willing to put the time, energy, and effort to do that now. So then the I'm gonna put you on a spot though. Yeah. We didn't, this is not even in our outline. I look at my org chart. I'm very clear about who I need and what they need to be doing and at what price and how to do it. I've got a gap, mm -hmm. right? But times of the essence, like as the CEO, like how do we adapt when we know we've got a known gap? We're already running like, do we have to put that, we have to wear that hat ourselves? Like, how do we do that? Yeah, that, it, it, that's a great question. Uh, dang you for asking, uh, <laughs> because it happens to all of us. There's always that gap for a period of time, right? The train's running and we got a missing piece. Um, it's all hands on deck is what I've always experienced. And, and it's a good point. It could be you. It could be someone else on the team who has to double duty it. Uh, yeah. Uh, Someone might have to wear a temporary role yeah. so that you're not hiring out of pain and getting a bad fit Yeah, that's because you just need someone so bad. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, it happens every time. So that you really brought up a great point and you have no choice. During that period, you don't want to just bring anybody in. That wouldn't be fair to them or the organization. But on the flip side, that means somebody or more than one are going to end up doing double duty for just a little while. That's the challenge. Uh -huh. Stuff, man. It's really tough, but it, that you have to do that. So number two is um, now you need to develop your people's skills, mm -hmm. right? So if you have the right people, if you will, now are they doing the right things? Are they doing it the right way? Right? Oh, yeah. And we see this huge in our industry. Um, we look up and what do we think? Maybe one in four or five real estate agents today actually worked in the last recession, mm. right? So right. very few of them have known anything other than the 11 years of slow growth. Yeah. They didn't have to grow a business. And so like those skills have to be retrained. That's right. They can be documented, but like, so how we function in this market, we have to figure it out and they, they need new skills. That's right. That's exactly right. So if you, if you have people in an organization, you have to be committed to making sure that the training that is necessary for them to know how to do their job is available to them. Well, the third thing is you have to commit to efficiencies. Okay. And this is a big one for me because particularly in our industry, the real estate space, Jay, man, there are people that have fallen in love with their edge case that we have. So instead of a straight line, uh, people look up and go, but you know, I want to do it this way. And they zig and they zag to get where they need to go. And in a shift, man, that's a big problem. It's confusing and it is very expensive to zig and zag. But you look up and a good example of this would be in technology, what we experience. And that is, oh, 
now that these times are good, I always wanted to do this. You know, I think it'd be cool if we did that. And they then, right, and then they start making their technology do that. And they just add complexity upon complexity instead of just going from point A to point B. Mm-hmm. They, they zig and zag their way to it. And boy, it's death by a, by a dozen edge cases. And that's, it's so inefficient. It's so inefficient. Uh, and One it, of your truisms that you sometimes say is, are, are you is successful because of what you do or in spite of what you're doing? Yeah. And I think when times are good and our bank account's overflowing because the business is showing up like it normally should, we do start to get creative. And then when the market shifts, I think that's when you should be able to get really clear about what we're succeeding in spite of or because of. But that's when you have to cut out the nonsense, right? Yeah, it's that quality over quantity. And a lot of people get caught up in the quantity, right? We're, if, if Look, our competitor does three things, we do 10, which means we must be better. Right, which takes your people more time. It costs you more to serve every customer. That's it. Whereas if you just ask the customers, which we talked about again and again, That's right. they may only value three of the 10 steps. Yeah. You may be beating your competition doing three things instead of two things. That's right. But now you're wasting all that effort on seven more. Well, that's right. Uh, well said. That's exactly right. So I'm, I'm big into that. I, I, I think efficiencies really matter. And this is the opportunity to make sure that you have simple systems that do exactly what you want, because it's going to be easier for your people to grasp it, understand it, uh, to learn it, master it, if you will, and, and go deliver that. And when you keep adding complexity, all this complexity, thinking that, oh, we'll plus it, we'll plus it, we'll plus it. Actually, you're just creating edge cases that do not give you a, a really powerful return on your investment. It creates a lot of brain damage along the way. Well, I'm going to circle back. When we update people's job descriptions, we're the, we, we've got our new model. We need to ask the question, what are the legacy things that we've been doing that don't matter anymore? Yeah, there you go. Because you have a lot of people that might be one or two removed from you as the leader that don't really understand when the model changed that this thing that takes 15 hours a week is no longer required. Well, and they probably will, because you want people that were doing those tasks to be the kind that at 3 a.m. or 4 p.m., whatever the time was, they had to push the button, they were always gonna do it. Yeah, Those people won't stop doing it until they're given permission to, yeah. because they've got a new button to push. Yeah, that's right, yep. Uh, number four is know your, K, your key uh, KPIs. Okay. Right. Your key performance indicators. And that's, this is about accountability and also like to your goals and for people. Like I know, know what the, I'm measuring you by and our success by. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Know your numbers. Okay. Know, know the, the key areas that matter and know the numbers and then track those daily and weekly. Do not, do not wait a month. Do not wait a quarter. Not in a shift. You cannot do that. You, is that you, because things are just changing too rapidly you need to be looking at the odometer a lot more frequently okay yeah 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 yes absolutely yes and and that could go on for a year or so most likely a year but uh because it usually takes that long for the market to begin to understand where it is Mm -hmm. and everyone begin to be comfortable with where they are but yeah, you, you, you have to track it daily. You have to track it weekly. You have to say, did we hit that number? Did we hit that number? Did we hit that number? Yes. Right. Well, I think when you say it takes 10 to 12 months, my first thought was like most recessions like are eight months or less when yeah. you go back in time. That's right. But when you come out of that recession, the, the, the playing field may be materially different, meaning the game has changed and you have to be watching for that as well. Yeah. Tough times can last longer than that. But the actual de- definition, if you will, of the receding right. of the market usually operates within a year. Right. It, 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 it drops. That's exactly right. So know your, your, your KPIs. Be very clear about the key things that you're going to track and then track them. I got to tell you, I mean, you know, um, the times that, that I have gotten a little lost as a businessman is when, for whatever reason, I got away from looking at my my KPIs, and uh, I have a, a simple system that has kept me honest and going my entire career, and that is I track the moving uh, ten year numbers. Right, 
So I'm looking at the previous nine years and this year's, and you would be, I don't think. Yeah, and, and just because I've seen this, right? You have, we have like 31 numbers that we track, at least in our yeah, big document. That's right. You've got them each month. We update them. Yeah. And you can look back 10 years. That's How did right. we do in April yeah. of 2021, 2020, yeah. 19, 18, so forth. Yeah. And well, I, that's how you see trends. It, that's right. That's right. You you spot it immediately. It, it gives you it gives you such amazing perspective uh, about where you are and how that relates to where you've been, and also potentially what could happen in the future. All of that's possible uh, when you track your 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 key performance indicators and do it over. And I think ten years fine. I, I I don't know why you would do it more than that, but. Uh, well, market cycle. We've talked about this. Most market, big market cycles, tend to be around seven to ten years. So you're right. going to see the whole thing right there. Yeah, that's exactly right. And the last one for me, uh, Jay, is be cautious. And you said this earlier, but I just want to again. I just want to cross that T, and that is, do not rush to just start doing mass layoffs. Don't do that. Right. Be, that 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 is not the way to go. You need you need to have some sort of a sense of what your business model is uh for your for your next at least three years three to five is fine but no less than three what that is what the goal around that would be the plan the budget the org chart make sure you're real clear about that before you sit down and start saying well um we need to reduce our our workforce well the of all the things that go into that chain right that domino chain of my model, right, that leads to my plan, that leads to my budget, that leads to my org chart, the hard, hardest and slowest one to shift is the org chart. Yeah, that's right. And so, like, that should be based, any decisions there are based on those. And as you said, I want to say even beyond cautious, make it a very informed decision. Yeah. Right? Not, a, not something that you're rushing to do just to save the balance sheet or the P&L. Yes. Now, that's exactly right. I'm going to go back to something you said earlier, right? We want to become a company that people flee to, not flee from. I think when the CEO has done that hard work of figuring out the new math and the new model, and based on that, what has to happen in the budget and the plan, and then the org, like, I think that your people feel that. Even if you're still figuring out how to articulate it, what they sense is, oh, we've got a, our compass is fixed. We know where we're going, and that that changes the whole morale of the endeavor. It does. It can be messy, though. I just want to oh, caution. Yeah. It can be messy. I, I having experienced that in the last few years, it can be very messy and can be a little demoralizing if you're not careful. Mm. It's hard. It's almost hard not to have a little bit of that when you're trying to figure things out. How do you maintain your optimism in that moment? Because the leader, you've got to project hope, right? Yeah. Well, I'm. I've never had a problem with optimism, uh, <laughs> mainly because being a, a, a somewhat of a student of history and an observer of my own life experiences, the the sun will come out. The the the, the here's the, here's the fact that I know, and that is is that recessions are a normal part of the business cycle. Mm -hmm. So what I know is that up is caused by down, and. Right? And, and down, down eventually will cause it to go back up. That's exactly right. They drive each other. So that's where my optimism comes from. It's not a Pollyannish view. It's an economic view. And that is tough times don't last. Mm -hmm. Right? They don't. They just don't. They don't. Uh, we, we know they won't. And we know that we will come out of this. So start planning for that now. Make sure that you're not just trying to survive. Make sure you're also planning to thrive because this is not to wish a recession on any of us because they're they're tough man but this is this is when great things can happen when you get lean and mean get your fighting machine together right and start focusing on a plan that will not only help you get through this economically but is actually designed to to shoot you out like a rocket as things begin to settle down 
and start to go up. That's the nature of one of these shifts is that everybody gets hit by it. The people who adapt to it and do the right things have an increased opportunity on the other side. And it just shows up again and again. Yeah. You know, we went into the last recession four, came out number one, right? And that's like evidence that in my personal life of seeing it in action, um, it's not, it's one of those things that I look up and we talk about hope. Now I'm thinking, okay, this is a normal part of the cycle. When we do the right things, this could be temporarily painful, but it actually can yield benefits on the other side. It's a kind of a cleanse too for your whole model. Like yeah. you've refreshed it, you're more clear about it. Those things that you leave on the back shelf sometimes. Yeah, most, you know, again, I, 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 I've seen this way too many times in, in my lifetime uh, where people go sit on the sideline and go, man, these are tough times. Um, and you know what? I'm just gonna wait till they get better. Oh my gosh, oh my no. gosh, oh my gosh. That's, um, you, you might as well close up your shop, hmm. to be honest with you. The, it doesn't work like that. You, you can't do that. You literally, I, the way I think about it and the way you've heard me say this is you ought to put your head down, keep your heart up, keep your feet moving and keep hope. Love that. Yep. Hey, did you enjoy that content? You should really check out some of this other stuff that we have to share. And if you like all of this, make sure that you click our subscribe and follow our YouTube channel so you don't miss a single thing.